Hey everybody, when um, my wife and I uh, came back from LA to start a family here, there were a couple things on my mind and one of them was uh, what would happen to my acting career? Um, could I live in Vermont and still have an acting career? No. The other thing that I was wondering about is I was beginning to get into screenplays and I was again wondering could I live in Vermont and seriously have a, a screenplay writing career? And all my LA friends made sure that while they wouldn't laugh at me, it was a near impossibility. Now this was 25 years ago. So things may have changed and things may have gotten better. And today my guest is... I'm Jacob Kruger. I'm the founder of Jacob Kruger Studio in New York City. Um, and I spent many years as a screenwriter and producer and I now work with uh, writers all over the world. Um, we have classes in New York City and we have uh, a unique online component where students can join us from Vermont, from Italy, from anywhere in the world and be part of our live classes. And he's going to tell us, can you be a Vermonter and write for film? Can you be a Vermonter and write for TV or is it all just a pipe dream and let's go grow more zucchinis or whatever? All right, so here we go. Let's flip the camera. So Jacob, thanks for joining us at the Kitchen Set in the GNAT Studios. And uh, I guess the first question is the market for film and TV um, now as opposed to when I was out there 25 years ago. Well, for me, I think this is probably the most exciting time ever to be a screenwriter or a television writer. Um, and there are a couple different reasons for that. Uh, the first is that there's a real renaissance happening on television, uh, which you're probably aware of if you watch anything on TV. Right, right. Um, and basically, this started with HBO a couple years ago, actually many years ago. But now with Netflix and Amazon, we're kind of living in, remember the internet boom? Yes. Where suddenly it was the Wild West again? and uh, the rules of how money was made were changing. Right. We're seeing the same thing happen now in television, where, um, where shows that break the mold are actually selling, and the traditional shows are a lot less popular. Um, right. And so that's created tremendous opportunity for emerging writers. And what we're starting to see is a shakeup happening where now television, it used to be like television was where you went to die. Yes, you go to a soap opera for work, yes. <laughs> exactly, it used to be that was where you went to die, and now what we're seeing is television is where the great work is happening. And we're seeing a change even in feature films where basically people have realized, it's so funny, when I talk to managers and agents, I always talk to the young, the young people because I, I'm excited, those are the people who are most likely to represent my students. Right. And when I talk to those young managers, you know, even five years ago, they would be talking about money, 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 pitch, 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 hook, hook, hook. Okay. Now they talk about, we're making art. We're going out there, we're making art. We're looking for voices. We're looking for the person that, they're the only person in the world who could have written this script. Now, is that real or is that smoke? Well, this is what's so interesting, Haas, is <laughs> it's both. Okay, I'll take it's that. It's not that managers and agents suddenly turned around and became artists. It's that they realize that there's money in art, that these shows that have a unique voice are suddenly standing out. And one of the problems that they have, the, the benefit of being a TV writer right now is the voracious appetite. The hunger for it is unlimited. Right, my understanding is, is the need for content is almost out of control. It is out of control, which right. is great if you're a writer. Right. Um, and the downside for the executives, for the studios, is that there's so much content that the normal stuff doesn't really break through anymore. That you need the show that somehow cuts through all right. the chatter because the market share is so much more divided up among all these different shows. And so let me follow up on that. So what you're also saying is that, um, is that the show, your show idea now must be so unique it, in a sense it's not replicating? It's well, and, and this is interesting. We just did a panel. We brought uh, our whole faculty up here and we, we did a panel about this last night actually um, because the fear, the fear of needing to write something unique sometimes gets in the way. Right. right. So sometimes we're like, well, my idea is not good enough or someday I'll create the right idea and then I'll write it. Um, when really what it is, it's about voice. It's about uh, disruptive voices. And the truth is that all voices are disruptive right. if we take the sensor off of ourselves. 
And so like that's a big part of our work at the studio is like, you know, you've been trained most likely since you were two years old to censor yourself. You know, since mommy said, yeah, mommy said, don't cry. Right. You know, uh, your teacher said, don't speak before you think. And you end up with this filter on yourself, which is great if you want to be a lawyer. Okay, but let me, uh, but I, we always hear that, um, that Hollywood doesn't necessarily like something new. They, they like something more of the same. So they may choose to fund something more of the same, but you're saying they look for something different to be convinced that you can make something more of the same? I'm so glad you're asking that question. So it's a little bit of both. In television, you know, BoJack Horseman isn't more of the same. Okay. Right? Right. Um, uh, uh, Fleabag is not more of the same. There is real demand for difference. Game of Thrones is not more of the same. Exactly. Um, so in television, there is a real desire for disruptive thought. And one of the things that you're actually seeing is they're looking to playwrights to write these shows. Um, and the reason they're looking for playwrights is the playwrights training is generally a lot better. Um, playwrights are generally trained by playwrights because playwrights are broke. And so every playwright is teaching playwriting. Right. Um, screenwriters, the successful ones, make a lot of money. And so what it ends up happening is the successful screenwriters, you know, we have a couple of them at the studio that we're lucky enough to have, but you have to really work to find those people. And most of them don't have PhDs. And so, you know, at the major colleges, even some of the most prestigious colleges and, and film schools out there, mostly people are being taught by critics. They're being taught by professors mm. who may know a lot about film history, but maybe never actually sold a script or sat in a writer's room. And so what ends up happening is you get a lot of this theory that ends up getting in the way of the, of the, the content that could actually sell. Right. So okay. um, I'm not going to pretend Hollywood is an ugly place. It's like high school. It's a popularity contest. We all know this. Um, you're fortunate right now in that the popularity contest had sh has shifted to go like, who's got something unique to say? OK, so let me just follow up on that, because one of the things um, one of the questions was also the writer of 25 years ago versus the writer of now, and you're sort of talking about that. So the writer of now, how would he be different than from the writer of 25 years ago? Well, I was the writer 25 years ago. Um, and <laughs> so what's interesting... How have you changed, Jake? I've him. gotten a lot older. <laughs> <laughs> so what's interesting is when I was coming up, uh, in the 90s, you could still sell off a pitch. Right. So, for example, if you've read Blake Snyder, Save the Cat, yeah. that's a book written for the 90s, when you could still sell off a pitch. Um, as a young writer today, particularly in feature films, television's a little different right now, but in feature films, you, you can't sell off a pitch anymore. It's all about, and there's not a hot spec market right now. And so really the way that we're seeing our feature film writers get noticed, um, I'll tell you a story in a sec actually, I've got okay. a good one about that. Um, the way we're seeing our feature film writers get noticed is often by writing the script that they can't get sold. So it's, they write the script, the one that they're desperate to see on the screen that only they could write. Right. And then a producer reads it and they're like, my God, I wish I could make this. There's so, no way I'll get that past my boss. And then once that happens, then they're going like, well, I, my boss said no, but I want this writer. W you know, I had that Hungry Hungry Hippos movie that I optioned. Maybe I'll put this okay. writer on the Hungry Hungry Hippos movie. So we're seeing. So by demanding the script, they can tell you can make a cake rather than just show the recipe. I exactly. And that's one of the biggest changes that we're seeing. So um, Pamela Cedarquist, uh, one of my incredible students, um, she just completed her first stint as a staff writer on Mindhunter, the, mm -hmm. the new David Fincher Netflix show. Got it. She got onto that show not based on a pilot. She got onto that show based on a, uh, a spec script, a spec feature that she wrote as part of our ProTrack program that has not yet sold. Mm -hmm. um, even though I think she's going to sell it. Uh, she just did a new draft that's so freaking good. Right. But, um, but that, that was script, the opening. That first, that first version that she sent around, she got some notes. Right. Um, but that producer didn't buy it. Um, mm -hmm. But when they needed someone for Mindhunter, they reached out to Pamela. So what we're seeing is, is a real phenomenon where like voice sells today, when back then it was hook sells. You still have to have a hook. Oh, that's a nice sum up. Right, you still need a hook, but 
It but better have voice. If you don't have the execution today, right. if you have to, have, it used to be you had to have the craft. Right. Now, if you don't have the art too, you don't have a shot. And actually, as a young writer, well, let me ask you, how old is Pamela? Uh, well, you'll be interested. In, I'm not going to tell you her actual age, but I will is tell you. Is she in you, the 20s, 30s? No, she is not. So let's talk about that whole, uh, what I hear a lot, um, I guess, ageism, right? Yeah. So you're about to tell me something well, there. Well, if you are an actor, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> it still it's sucks? Because it's real, especially if you're a woman. Yes, um, it hasn't changed. It is unfair and it's terrible. Um, and the good news for you, if you're making your own web series or your own feature film, right. is that um, reach out to any actress over 40 and you can probably get her. Right. Uh, unless it's Meryl Streep. Right. You can probably no, get I, her. I got you. Which is really exciting because there are great actresses out there. But and there's sad. A, there, there's a real problem. It, right. it, it's really sad. People are starting to recognize it, so at least that's good. Um, but they're starting to feel a little bit of shame. I feel though in our lifetime, you and I are going to be long dead before no one will ever discuss this issue again. You know, I feel like, I, I, I like to err on the side of hope. I okay, think that I'll go. one of my great, great mentors <laughs> was a guy named that. Bill Cook. Uh, and Bill Cook like marched next to Martin Luther King, like they were buddies. Yep. Um, just an amazing man. And Bill Cook used to always say, like, I hate when young black men say to me, it's worse than ever. He said, okay. uh, he said it's better than ever. It just gets better too slowly. And, and I think that's something that we're seeing in Hollywood right now is it is actually better than ever. It just gets better too slowly. And, yeah. you know, even like, I mean, this is a side, but the, the Harvey Weinstein thing, right. you know, 10 years ago, he's untouchable. Yes. The fact that that's even possible now is progress, even though it's horrible that that, that went on for, the, for that long. So I think, I think we do live in a world that's getting better. I think it just gets better slowly, and there are a lot of hiccups along the way. So a uh, female writer in her 60s. I, I'm not going to tell you Pamela's age, but I will tell you that Pamela is not in her 30s. <laughs> um, right. Pamela is, um, at, you know, Pamela's had a, a whole other career. This is her, her second career as a writer. So then let me, uh, let me keep pushing on this. Are you saying then um, a, a man in his 60s, a woman in his 60s, um, that they will seriously consider you? This is, this is what I say to my students. Yes, there's chauvinism. Yes, there's racism. There is no doubt about it. But. There's racism and chauvinism and ageism everywhere in the world. Yeah, I know. I, and the truth yeah. of the matter is, it's impossible to sell a script. Everybody knows that. It's impossible to get, uh, become a staff writer. Everybody knows that. And yet people do it every day. Right. So if your odds are one in a million, does it matter if your odds are one in 10 million? Um, right. What yeah. I believe, but the great thing that we have as writers that, that actors don't have is we have a script that travels without us. So they may go like, oh, I assume she was younger after they meet you. Um, but they've already read the script. They already know they like you. They already know they right. like you enough to take a meeting. Um, so I'm not going to pretend like Hollywood doesn't skew towards younger people. It does. But at least as right. a writer, you have a product that can travel without you. Yeah. Um, you have a product that can so speak for it's, itself. It's our headshot, but they can't really see us. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and you have a chance on the page to introduce them and basically say, you know, and, and part of the problem that, that some, some people have is that they are still referencing films from the 80s, you know? And I think that part of it is you have to stay current. Even no matter what your age is, I have to stay current. I I watch a lot. If you listen to my podcast, yeah. I watch a lot of movies that I don't like, um, that aren't my genre. Right. Because I need to know what's happening in the industry now if I'm going to stay relevant. Um, so I may have might have grown up with a different world or a different genre or a different kind of movie making, or television making, but. I gotta watch every TV show. I've gotta watch, or at least every TV show I can, there's so many. Yeah, yeah. I gotta watch every movie that I can. Uh, I have to stay relevant and make sure that, that I don't wanna be derivative, but make sure that my writing is not, is, it, it might be echoing a different era, like Stranger Things, but not stuck in a different era. Okay. I guess, then I'd like you to, to answer that big question. Can a Vermonter, 
can a Vermonter make it in the film and TV industry if they want to stay in Vermont and raise a family? Um, let me talk about what's hard about that, and let me talk about what's possible about that. Okay. Um, there's a big change happening, right? Even Mindhunters, uh, the writer's room was in New Mexico. It wasn't in Los Angeles. It wasn't in, in New York. Um, and Pamela, for example, did a lot of writing from her home. She lives in Woodstock. Um, so she did a lot of writing from there. Um, so is it possible? Of course it is. We have video conferencing. Um, we, you know, even our students, uh, most of our students are not in New York City. Um, most of our students meet with their mentors via video chat. Um, even our, our online students, often they video chat into the classes and participate in that way. Um, right. At writer's rooms, it's not unusual to have someone on video chat now. So um, it's not preferred, right? Everyone would rather be in the room. So, um, so let me just follow yeah. up on that. So I can communicate you for, with you from a distance, but it's still not preferred. No, of course not, right? And, and does that eventually turn into, that's a pain in my ass, Haas? Well, this is what I think. Haas, if I say to you, here is a huge contract um, to write for a hit Netflix show, but it means you're going to have to spend six months of the year out of Vermont. Yeah. Then you have a hard choice to make. But that's a high class problem. Right. So the, the good news about living in Vermont is it's a lot cheaper. Um, you probably ha have a lot more time to write than someone who's living a hectic city life in Los Angeles. Right. Um, you, the other thing about Vermont is it's a great place to shoot. Um, and so you can, living in Vermont, you can make your own web series. And what I love about web series, we're really, we're really um, we have a very strong web series writing teacher, Karen Parton Wells at, at the studio. Um, and we're, we're really gung-ho in web series. Uh, and the reason for that is you can control everything. You can shoot it on a couple dollars. The only thing you have to do really well is sound. Right. Um, right. Y there are actors in Vermont, for sure. I understand you're available, <laughs> right? So there are <laughs> actors in Vermont. You have beautiful <laughs> locations. And unlike Los Angeles or New York, where people are used to getting someone knocking on their door every day and aren't excited and want a lot of money for it, in Vermont, people are going to be excited to be involved in a movie or to be involved in a web series. OK, but let me just back up. Yeah. So kind of what you said is, you can communicate long distance, but there may be this point where they're saying, how long are you going to stay out there before you come to town to stay? I don't so, think that that conversation is going to happen. I think what's going to happen is, it, let me talk about what the obstacle is. The right. obstacle is just so much of business is bumping into people. Right. New York is harder than Los Angeles. And that's just because in New York, 80% of the people I bump into are not in the film industry, and only 20% are. In Los Angeles, 90% of people are in the film industry. Uh, I remember when, I, when my plumber pitched me a script, that was when I knew I had to leave, right? But it was like <laughs> literally everybody, everybody, the homeless people are writing I scripts. Know. Everybody wants to be in, a, in, a, in the industry. But, in right. So we're sort of mixing up film and TV, I know, a little bit. And that's sort of probably not fair because they're bleeding over though. They're bleeding over. But what I hear a lot about if you're going to write for TV is you've got the room problem. Yeah. Can you go into that a yeah, little bit? Yeah. Well, so this is really simple. Um, if you want to write for television, you're going to write some pilots. It used to be you wrote spec episodes. Yeah. But um, and it used to be you couldn't get anyone 2 years ago to get someone to read a pilot. We didn't even teach it. It was impossible. I would say, "Oh, you want to write a pilot? Um, you're not going to sell it. No one will no one will read it. You're either going to make it yourself or forget it." Right. Now, it's the only thing anyone wants to read. They all want to read pilots. No one's reading spec episodes anymore. And so, why? Um, because of the demand. A spec episode, they can't actually sell. It's only a writing sample. Now that there's so much demand, everyone's looking for the new pilot. The other thing, people love pilots because they're short. So it's a <laughs> quick, easy read for the producer. <laughs> a lot of feature film producers want to read a pilot. Because it's faster. You know, I, I think it's better. But Jacob, yeah. you're really still going to lead me down the road. i got to move. I'm going to lead you down the road of when there are a million dollars at the line, you're going to make a hard decision. Um, it's, it's really at the point that it's sold. 
that you are going to have an issue. Now, the truth is, but can you stop at that point? I, I know I'm breaking. They would be delighted. Can you just say I wrote this pilot and I'm selling it, and they say we love that pilot, we buy it, and I say. I really don't need to go to the room because I really want to stay here and just do this. Yes. Yeah, so what, what you would normally do, and some, some producers will actually be happy about this because you're an inexperienced writer and <laughs> it's going to cost them less money that way. Gotcha. Um, okay. So no matter what, you're going to be paired with a showrunner. Um, no one's going to let you run your own show. Right. So, so if I jettison and say, just pay me for the pilot, I'm out of here. That's right. And but usually, you're saying I'm leaving a lot of money on the table. You are, but you're going to probably negotiate, if you have a good lawyer, you're going to negotiate a created by credit. Okay. You're going to negotiate a consultant credit so that right. you can, so they're going to keep you involved in some way if they really like your work. Um, but, you know. That doesn't sit well with you, though. Why doesn't that sit well with you? It's your baby. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that. You would go with it, wouldn't you? I would go with it because it's my right. baby. Um, yeah. I, I don't want somebody else making it. I want to make it myself. Now, even though you're lowly on the ladder, you still feel like you can protect well, it? Well, it's only the beginning of being lowly on the ladder. You're also the creator. If you have a great lawyer and there's a bidding war or something, you okay. can negotiate more power. Right. Um, but you know, my feeling is like, hey, I live in New York City. I right. love. I mean, you're there, so yes. you don't have to go anywhere. Right, right. There's no cost to you from to move. But like I said, uh, Pamela lives in Woodstock. She right. doesn't live in New Mexico, where the writers' room is. But she goes when she has to go. So interesting. Okay, so so I think these are hard decisions. But yeah. I think look, you don't have to make the decision right now. And there is right. one other way that we haven't talked about, Haas. Okay, fire. Which is do it yourself. Um, yeah. There are, you can make a web series and you get 2 million hits. You get 10 million hits. Right. You can distribute it on your own YouTube channel, on your own social media. It can cost you a few thousand dollars. You get 10 million hits. You tell, you tell Hollywood, yeah, you want it? Fine. I want the writer's room to be in Vermont. Right. Um, so that, that almost seems like it would be, a, is that a better, well, it's not a better way, but it is, it is a more satisfying way. It would be a more satisfying way to you than just selling it and walking away. For me, doing something <laughs> yourself is always more satisfying. You yes. know why? <laughs> um, because nobody can tell you what to do. Right. And you know, that's one of the reasons I moved to New York. Uh, I was really good at writing for hire, and I made a lot of money writing for hire, but writing for hire was never as much fun for me as doing what I wanted to do, um, being an artist. And so what's awesome is, and this is the way it's going, like the, you, you know, we were talking earlier about like what's the future. Well, oh, okay, yes. Right? I mean, like, all right, let's go there. Um, the wall is falling, Haas. You know, it's- Now when you say a wall, do you mean the control of LA and New York to, to, to have total control of the market? Yes, and the wall between web series and television is falling. Interesting. And right. the distribution model of feature film is changing. It's only a matter of time before somebody realizes I don't need Warner Brothers to distribute my film. Yeah. I can distribute my film over, there's eventually going to be some app yeah. that's the film distribution app for an independent film. And you won't have to wait around right. for somebody to, to catch you at Sundance and, option, and buy your, your movie and distribute it. Right. You'll be able to go like, yeah, I have 100 million hits on whatever that feed is, and I've got advertisers coming to me, right. and I'm generating all the money I could possibly. We're years from this, but this is where it's going. Um, we're going towards a model where literally anyone can distribute. Um, we're actually already there. It's just the, these studios have a tremendous amount of money, so it's slow. If you want to do television and you really don't want to leave, Today, make web series. Do it yourself. Once you, once you get a lot of people, uh, for example, my friend works for Casper Mattresses. If you can show Casper that you have a certain amount of audience, they will give you a lot of money to run yeah. Casper ads because they know what their return is. Gotcha. So what I would say is you're not going to make the same money that you would make in Los Angeles, but if money is not the thing that matters to you, um, or, or writing for a big TV show for a big studio is not what matters to you, but you want to be an artist and you want to make stuff, Yeah, make great content right here. 
you'll be helping your state <laughs> because people will realize great <laughs> content can be made here. Right. And think about what you have. Don't think about what you don't have. Think about what do you have among your friends, your family, your neighbors that you could shoot that would look awesome. Um, and the truth is, in a lot of ways, you have a lot more because you have space here, which we don't have in the cities. So I would think about what do I have that would be an awesome place to shoot a web series or an independent film. Right. And what I would do is, we got Kickstarter. You can raise money for it now. I, you have friends who are probably going to be excited. You can get free locations. I would do it, and I would make my money that way because there is money to be made there, and it's, there's only going to be more. And maybe you won't get rich, right. but, but it doesn't sound like the goal here, for you at least, would be to get rich. The goal is like, how do I have an artistic life yeah. doing the thing that I love and living in Vermont? And I think that there is a better opportunity now. You can submit your film to film festivals. Than ever before. It, exactly right. So before I let you go, yeah. all right, w along those lines, when you look at genre and you look at Vermont, I mean, besides the, you know, besides where you would normally go. So what if you were saying make a web series of Vermont, is there a genre that you know that works really well in the web series world? Um, well, I think for me personally, yeah. I think the easiest thing to sell is a comedy. Uh, I, if I was making a web series, I'd make a three minute comedy. Um, and the reason for that is totally tactical, is people love to forward funny stuff. Yeah. And people like to watch about three minutes. So if it was me, I'd make a three minute web series. I'd, I'd write 12 episodes, that's 36 minutes of shooting. I can shoot the whole thing in a week. And I'd, I'd break it down and I'd re I, then I'd figure it out. I'd probably hold it for a year while I worked on the marketing. Right. Release it all at once with a great marketing campaign behind it while I'm working on my season two. All right, now I said, I know I said this was the last question, but you just triggered something else. So could I not make a hour long TV show that would be wonderful if it was on HBO, but it turns out it's just gonna be on the web, but you in can. that same world? You can, and in fact, there are people at ITV Fest who do. Um, in fact, uh, the winner last year ended up getting distribution. So um, that happens, and that is a drama. So that certainly happens. Um, but my feeling is I would rather make, ITVFS won't like me for saying this, um, I think making web series makes a hell of a lot of sense because it's, ch it's cheap. It's cheap. Um, cheap and short. Yes. If I, you want to make a pilot, like I actually have a student um, who uh, try, talk about ageism. Um, she's over 50. She, um, she did not get picked up, she shopped it around, everybody loved it, everyone's like, it was about over 50 women. Yeah. People didn't want to buy it. So she said, screw it, I can make this myself. And she's, um, she made it, she got some huge actors yeah. who were excited to be a part of it. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, it's called uh, the, new, the New F Word. Uh, <laughs> I think that's what it's called. Uh, I, I was a about. But we get the that. idea. Her name's Kate the Gentis. You can yeah. look her up. Yeah. Um, and it's oh the other F word. Yeah, the it's called the other F word. Um, Kate the Gentis. She got some huge actors, known names, and she made it herself. And they're going into their second season now. She's distributing it herself on Amazon and making money. So there are there there is definitely a market for for pilots. I would make a web series first for two reasons. Okay. Number one, you're going to spend less money, yeah. and it's going to be easier to distribute. Number two is you can make your mistake on the web series. Got it. Right? Make your mistake on the short form content so that when you set out to do a half hour pilot or an hour pilot and now you're spending $100,000 or a million dollars, right. that you've, you've already made. made all your mistakes, you already have your crew, you have your cinematographer you trust, yeah. you have your team together. Yeah. Whereas your web series, there's very little expectation except good sound. You have to have good sound. Have to have good sound. So there's very little expectation. The production values can be crappy as long as the content's really good. Right. They'll forgive you. All right. Hey, <laughs> Jacob. <laughs> this was such a pleasure. Thank you very much for Thank your time. Thank you so we much. It was a pleasure to be here. <laughs>